All, this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So today I want to present to you a study that is first of its kind. It is a study from Australia and, and published in American Geriatrics Association's uh, journal. This study essentially shows a longitudinal effect of anxiety on the development of dementia. And I think you can uh, you can probably already assess that this will be the case that anxiety leads to dementia. So the question is, how does it do it and what did they find? So let's look at this study together. So anxiety and dementia is the discussion today. Let me very quickly show you the study itself. So this is drbean.com. There are so many more medical lectures there. So if you would love them, you can become a member. Links are in the description. So anxiety. Anxiety is an emotion characterized by feeling of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased blood pressure. Dementia is a general term for loss of memory, language, problem solving, and other thinking abilities that serve enough, severe enough, to interfere with daily life. Alzheimer's is the most common kind of dementia. This is the study, the effect of anxiety on all-cause dementia, a longitudinal analysis from the Hunter Community Study. And look at the date, 24 July 2024. So pretty recent and first of its kind as well, because the previous studies, according to the authors, the other studies that have been done to either show a connection or association between anxiety and dementia or the lack of the association, they are point in time studies and not longitudinal studies. So one more thing, I'm not going to go too much in detail of the mechanism because yesterday I was discussing mechanisms with patrons and Substack members and YouTube members, and it took me two, and a, two hours, 15 minutes to actually go over all the mechanistic um, um, uh, approaches that occur as anxiety cause this effect. So I cannot produce that over here. But if you like it, after this video, I can do another chit chat like live video and discuss that. But that is only if this is something that is of interest to you. So let's start our discussion. So anxiety and dementia. This is the study that you just saw. So why does this paper matter? I think this was interesting for us to know. The, to our knowledge, so this is from the paper. The authors say that to our knowledge, this is the first study assessing the effect of persistence of anxiety. Chronic versus resolved versus new, and I would explain what that means. And then timing of exposure to anxiety on dementia risk. This study found that both chronic and new anxiety at follow-up were associated with increased risk of all-cause dementia. And the association was stronger in participa participants exposed to anxiety below the age of 70 years. That's very interesting. Because I had thought it may be for the higher age, but it seems like lesser age gets more impacted, number one. And number two, this, uh, this was also interesting for me to see that actually new onset anxiety causes more uh, intense it is, or is associated with a higher hazard risk of dementia compared to chronic anxiety. Then they say, however, where anxiety had been resolved, there was no association with dementia risk. These results suggest the possibility of anxiety as a modifiable risk factor for dementia. This is the most important thing to understand, that dementia has many risk factors, some that we cannot change, for example, let's say genetics, and some that we can change. So the, the ones that we can change are called modifiable risks. So according to this study, they are saying that we are demonstrating that anxiety is a modifiable risk for dementia. So the results suggest the possibility of anxiety as a modifiable risk 
factor for dementia and the timely management of anxiety helps to reduce the risk of dementia. So here is a preview of the study. Australian study, there were 2,132 participants. Mean age was 76 years. 55 year to 60 year were excluded. They actually started from earlier ages, but they excluded 55 to 60 because the uh, incidence of anxiety was really small, I think in 0.01%. So they had groups that were 60 to 70 years, then 71 to 80, and then 80 plus. These were the three groups that they had. They used Kessler Psychological Distress Scale to understand anxiety. And this scale actually contains the uh, parameters for anxiety and depression. So they actually taken out, they took out the anxiety parameters and used them for anxiety. The study was done in multiple waves. The first wave was their, their baseline. So at the baseline, they did the demography and then they did the first score. At wave two, then they did another score. And then they did a follow-up that could be up to 13 years from the baseline. So from the baseline all the way up to 13, 13 years. They had divided the groups or the type of anxiety into three groups. If somebody had anxiety on the wave one or the baseline, and they had anxiety on the wave two or five years after the baseline, then they classified them as chronic anxiety patients. If somebody had anxiety at the baseline or wave one, but did not have it, at the wave two, which is five years later, then they classified that as resolved. And they say in their manuscript that they are not clear, they do not have the data to say how quickly it was resolved, other than knowing that after five years, the anxiety was not present. Now, was that resolved in one year or two years or three years? They did not know. Then was the new onset anxiety. This is where the participant at the wave one did not have anxiety. At wave two, that is five years later, the participant had anxiety. And then at follow-up, they would then look at their dementia risk. So these three were the classes of the anxiety. The results were interesting. Number one, the chronic anxiety. That is anxiety present on wave one, anxiety present on wave two. And then they did a follow-up within 13 years of the wave one. And they saw that the hazard ratio of the anxiety was 2.8 times higher. So the incidence was 2.8 times higher than the controls. If somebody had resolved anxiety, that is, it was present on the wave one, but not on wave two, they had zero or almost zero risk of dementia and new onset anxiety where they had anxiety. They did not have anxiety on, on wave one or the baseline. They had anxiety on wave two or five years later, and then they were followed up maybe another eight years later. The new onset anxiety patients had higher incidence of dementia, 3.2 times higher. And something that you would find strange, which is, I mean, again, there is a mechanistic approach that we can uh, use to understand it, but younger ages, and again, here the young age is 60 plus, younger ages and anxiety in that age had actually even higher hazard ratio for dementia compared to 70 plus. So here are the results. Chronic anxiety and new onset anxiety at follow-up were associated 
with all cause dementia risk hazard ratio 2.8 that is what we just saw confidence interval is 1.35 to 5.72 so 95 percent of the population would fall within the range of 1.35 times more dementia or association or hazard risk of the dementia to 5.72 and then look at this new onset anxiety new onset anxiety 3.2 Compare that to 2.8, which was for the chronic anxiety. So new onset anxiety would actually have higher hazard ratio and look at its confidence interval 1.4 to 7.45 with an average time to dementia diagnosis of 10 years. So somebody who develops an anxiety today could have the outcome of dementia about 10 years later in subgroup analysis, so this is some worth paying attention to, in subgroup analysis, these results were driven particularly by chronic and new anxiety among, among participants below the age of 70. And look at the hazard ratios. Chronic anxiety below the age of 70, 4.58 times. And the confidence interval very wide though 1.12 to 18.81 times and look at the hazard ratio of new onset anxiety in individuals below 70 years of age 7.21 times and the confidence interval 1.86 to 28.02 sensitivity analysis imputing missing data and addressing reverse causation gave very similar results so this is important to kind of notice here what they said was in their manuscript that dementia itself can lead to anxiety so the question then became that if somebody has a subclinical dementia so subclinical dementia will mean that the the damage the pathology of dementia has started but the symptoms have not yet become noticeable or apparent so it is subclinical so maybe somebody had subclinical dementia and dementia was causing the anxiety which we thought was anxiety first and then dementia appeared later so that was the reverse causality from dementia to anxiety and they said we did sensitivity analysis in which what they did was they excluded the patients of anxiety who had anxiety or who had dementia sorry within the first 5 years or who died within the first 5 year died of dementia they excluded them so that means they started from wave 2 to do the analysis where clearly the patients did not have dementia or anxiety before and then they measured them and the results were very similar so from this they say that it is apparent that the association is anxiety leading to dementia conclusion chronic and new anxiety were associated with increased risk of all cause dementia and this association was significant in those 70 years and younger however the resolved anxiety at follow-up reduced the risk similar to that of the non-exposed group. These results suggest that timely management of anxiety may be a viable strategy in, a redu in reducing the risk of dementia. So a quick note for the mechanism. And again, mechanism is kind of a very long discussion to have. But a quick note for how much they put in this manuscript. Anxiety is linked to vascular disease and dementia pathology via pathways such as neuronal inflammation, cellular apoptosis, brain and hippocampal atrophy, beta amyloid formation and deposition, and cardiovascular disease. We spent two and a half hour, about two and a half hour yesterday, discussing these mechanisms on all of these tissues. People with anxiety are more likely to engage in unhealthy lifestyle behaviors, including unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, and smoking, which in turn can lead to cardiovascular disease, which is strongly associated with dementia. Therefore, these are plausible direct and indirect mechanisms by which anxiety can increase the risk of dementia. 
So that is the discussion. I just want to, at the end, once again, put this slide in front of you that anxiety can lead to dementia. And I would just give you one example of possible mechanism. Just one. And if you would like, the rest of the mechanisms and have an open discussion, please tell me and I would do another live soon after this one and we'll go over those other mechanisms without any preparation. We'll just do a talk. So here is one mechanism. Hippocampus in our brain is responsible for looking at or, or letting in the newer memories into the memory pool. So it is responsible for the the short-term memories, which can then become intermediate and long-term. Hippocampus makes 500 new neurons every day. So there is neurogenesis that happens in hippocampus. Hippocampus has stem cells that can make new neurons. By the age of 50, starting from our birth, our hippocampus whole tissue actually exchanges and recycles to a fresh tissue because of the 500 new neurons forming every day. So you might say that, well, if we are making new neurons every day, wouldn't the hippocampus just keep becoming bigger and bigger and bigger? So that is true, but there are 500 neurons that die every day as well. So there is a balance. Some older neurons die and some newer neurons are born. Those new neurons then tackle more recent memories and more fresh memories and produce this short-term memory and connect it in, into the remaining brain system. When we are anxious, we produce glucocorticoids or corticosterones. We also activate the sympathetic nervous system that would then bring in norepinephrine and epinephrine. We also kind of reduce the effect of vagus nerve or parasympathetic nerves too. If I just take corticosterones, just one part of all of this, Corticosterones go to hippocampus and reduce the neurogenesis in the hippocampus. So new neuron formation reduces while the old neurons are still dying. That causes atrophy of the tissue that reduces the tissue volume. Plus, we find it difficult to make new memories because we don't have fresh new neurons. Corticosteroids in the hippocampus also reduce the metabolic activity of the neurons. So the neurons function less. Corticosteroid also cause the apoptosis of the neurons in the hippocampus, then they kill more or they induce killing for more neurons. So if the person is anxious and chronically anxious, we are then bombarding the hippocampus, which is an important area for memory, cognition, thinking, reasoning, planning, emotions, with the connecting with the limbic, limbic system, an important tissue starts becoming atrophied. And unfortunately, we were answering this question yesterday that if it is becoming atrophied, and imagine that anxiety is controlled, can the tissue catch up? So, of course, from this study, we know that if it is anxiety is resolved within five years, then yes, hippocampus catches up, or maybe there is not enough damage with the number of neurons that are reduced. But as the anxiety becomes chronic, more than five years, then what happens is that so many new neurons, older neurons have died, the volume has shrunk so much that even if you are starting to make 500 new neurons every day, it will not catch up to the previous size because there are 500 dying as every day as well. And that would then create a more persistent issue with the memory formation and dementia's triggering. So that is just one mechanism. There are tons of other me mechanisms to discuss as well. This is the discussion. Once again, thank you very much. Please like, subscribe, and share, share this. Maybe comment down here as well. There are links in the description of this video where you can become a patron or a Substack and use Buy Me a Coffee or best of all, become a member on drbean.com. With this, thank you very much. I'm going to now look at if there is a, <laughs> if we should have 
a discussion of the mechanism separately. Otherwise, we can do it tomorrow or the next week as well. Thank you very much and see you again. Bye for now.